Let's Talk About Mitts Baby is sponsored by Signature Hardware. If you're looking for that perfect item to take your kitchen, bathroom, or just your house up a notch, head over to SignatureHardware.com. They have honestly some of the most beautiful housewares I've ever seen. The vanities, oh my god, vanities. Who knew they could be so absolutely stunning? And I am a big bathtub person. So yes, I've just longingly scrolled through all of their bathtub options because why not? They've got beautiful bathroom furnishings and kitchen furnishings. You can get an incredible rain shower or this a beautiful farmhouse sink or maybe just a beautiful one of those things that hangs over your bathtub so you can have a glass of wine. I've actually picked out eight different furnishings that really stood out to me on Signature Hardware. They're my style. I just love them. They're absolutely just goals. See for yourself at SignatureHardware.com slash myths. You will be amazed at the variety and the quality. Oh, hello, dear listeners. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I'm Liv, lover of Greek mythology, hater of their patriarchal roots. And today I feel like it's a good time to state that it's very possible to feel this way, to think the ancient Greeks were some of the most incredible and brilliant minds the world has ever known, but that they also gave us a hell of a lot of bullshit, and that they were not, by any stretch of the imagination, the best or most important founders of any kind of civilization. And the way people today sometimes hold on to them as this example of why white Westerners are more impressive than their non-white, non-Western counterparts is bullshit. As I said on Twitter recently, it's just that the white men of the Western world had the loudest voices in the room and, and everyone else got drowned out. It's not that they were any better. Greek contemporaries from the East were just as incredible, just as brilliant, just as innovative. We just don't talk about it enough because white people, white people are the worst and only remember the people who looked like them. Anyway, just saying, as promised, today I'm back to finish off the story of the wonderful, incredible Penelope, wife of Odysseus, but I would say the true hero of the Odyssey. She's the one who dealt with a whole lot of bullshit for 20 years, maintaining her strength and patience that whole damn time, a queen. And there's another queen who took the back burner to her husband before ultimately being made the villain of all villains, but that's kind of all bullshit too. Well, mostly. She does do some fucked up stuff, but before we get there, we're going to look at why and how Medea got to that point. Two badass women taking over an episode. Yes, please. This is episode 64, Penelope and Medea, the heroines behind their heroes. Penelope. Penelope is the daughter of a man named Icarius and a naiad, Parabia. And Penelope wasn't always her name. No, Penelope was originally called Arnea. Her father, Icarius, once asked a son of Poseidon, Nopolius, to throw her into the sea. Why? We don't know. <laughs> but thankfully, rather than drown, Penelope was buoyed up by a flock of purple-striped ducks. They fed her, kept her afloat, and towed her to shore. This impressed her father. It was not particularly reassuring after he was the one having thrown her into the sea. In any event, now he's impressed. And so he and her mother, Parabia, rename her Penelope, which means duck. When Penelope is grown, she catches the eye of one Odysseus. You probably remember him. I fucking love him. King Tyndareus of Sparta is planning to marry off his daughter, his daughter famous for her incomprehensible beauty, Helen. He's planning to accept gifts from her suitors before choosing one of them. But Tyndareus is afraid of what may happen if he chooses one and not the others. Will it spark an argument? A fight? Will it get violent? Luckily, there's a man there to offer his assistance. Odysseus has been sent to woo Helen, but he isn't interested in her. He's gone there because he's supposed to, but... He's got a plan. He offers Tyndareus some advice for how to avoid a fight in the choosing of a man to marry Helen, and in return he asks Tyndareus for help in marrying the daughter of Tyndareus's brother, Icarius, Penelope. She is the one Odysseus is truly interested in, not Helen. Tyndareus agrees, what a great deal! And so it's Odysseus who proposes that Tyndareus have all of Helen's suitors swear an oath, that they will defend the eventual marriage at all costs, regardless of who Helen marries. 
The men agree. They swear that they will defend her marriage. And so they swear that they'll start the Trojan War, though they don't know it yet. Meanwhile, Odysseus plans to marry Penelope, who he's really into anyway, and quite happily, he avoids any and all of the drama associated with marrying Helen. He isn't into that. It's too much trouble, especially when there's another woman that he's more interested in. Tyndareus, in return for Odysseus' help earlier, arranges for him to win a suitor's foot race, the race that would decide who gets to marry Penelope. But Penelope's father, Icarius, he's not great. He did, after all, throw her into the sea. But he agrees to let Penelope marry Odysseus, and she's happy with the match. But after they marry, they plan to return to Odysseus's kingdom of Ithaca. They're physically in the chariot, about to leave. And this is when Icarius regrets his decision. He wants her to stay in Sparta, with him. He's kind of a creep, honestly. He tries to keep Penelope from leaving, but Odysseus is more than happy to stand up for them. He tells Penelope that she's welcome to stay behind with her father, but that he will be returning to his kingdom. It's up to her where she wants to go. Penelope, in response, she looks at her father, she draws her veil down over her eyes, and turns forward in the chariot. Quite the dramatic fuck you, Dad, I would say. So the couple return to Ithaca, where they rule together. This is an interesting moment. I want to assume that Icarius was a dick, because, I mean, he ordered her flung into the sea, and by all accounts otherwise was kind of dickish, and then his request to stay behind feels controlling, but in Robert Graves' explanation for this, he says that Odysseus insisting that Penelope travel to his kingdom actually breaks an ancient matrilocal rule in that region. By removing the woman from her kingdom, rather than having her new husband actually move there to rule with her, rather than the other way around, breaks this matrilocal rule. Fascinating. In Ithaca, Penelope and Odysseus are happy for a while, but it can't last forever, because again, that war is coming. I won't trouble you all by repeating how that comes about, but I will remind you that Odysseus tries very hard to get out of going to war, of abiding by the oath he himself swore to. Penelope has just given birth to their first child, Telemachus, when the men come knocking. They're calling on Odysseus to come to this war against Troy with them, with all the Greeks, because Helen, she's been taken away by the Trojan prince Paris. And they have, after all, sworn that oath. Odysseus pretends he's gone mad, anything to get out of this. It's kind of respectable, I think, and rare in this world to go to such lengths to get out of an oath, let alone one about war when you really want to stay home with your family. Typically, you simply must abide by such things, but Odysseus realizes that it's stupid, that he shouldn't have to go to war for this couple, Menelaus and Helen, and that they shouldn't start such an epic war for that reason anyway, and he wants to stay home with his wife and new baby. It's kind of nice. So he's willing to go against this oath and to lie to everyone involved. But in the end, you remember, his disguise is shattered when he's forced to choose between continuing to pretend he's gone mad and protecting his new baby. He chooses the baby, and it's given away. He's of sound mind, and he must go to this war. And he does. We all know. And Penelope, our real hero, is left alone in their palace for 20 years. How Penelope deals with Odysseus's absence, we've already talked about that. At length, she must deal with these shitty, shitty suitors, tricking them with her wiles and her desire not to remarry, but to wait for her husband to return home from the war even a full ten years after it's ended. She has faith and hope, and probably just doesn't want to risk ending up with a shitty dude. Odysseus, for all his faults, is pretty liberal when it comes to treating his wife with respect, allowing her to be how she wants, to do what she wants. It's pretty clear in Penelope's personality that she has a level of freedom and respect that most mortal women simply did not. According to Ovid's work, Herodes, Penelope writes constant letters to her husband while he's away. Of course, they don't have a mail service, and even if they did, I wouldn't think they would deliver to Calypso's Island. So instead, Penelope writes countless letters and gives them to whoever she can. Anyone traveling anywhere in the Greek world... She provides him with a letter in the hopes that it may eventually make its way to Odysseus. 
But time passes, and the suitors become more and more awful. She avoids choosing one to marry for some time, first by insisting that Odysseus must still be alive, then by insisting that she will choose a suitor once she's finished her father-in-law Laertes' funeral shroud, but it becomes more and more difficult to avoid these suitors. Thankfully, though, just as things are really coming to a head, Odysseus returns home. I won't bother telling you any of that again. We've just covered it. So much death, blood, guts. Good stuff. Go back and listen. Some say that Penelope did not remain faithful to Odysseus through all this, too. While she's often considered to be the token faithful woman who waits for her husband to return for two fucking decades, in other accounts, she... Well, she had quite a bit of fun while he was away. According to some versions, Penelope slept with one or two of the suitors while her husband is away. Or by other versions, she slept with all of them. It's even possible they had at least a couple of big old ancient Greek orgies. So all to say, it's quite possible that Penelope has her fair share of fun while her husband is off with Circe or Calypso having his own respect. Now, as for the end, after Odysseus has returned home, it's all very unclear what happens to them. There are many versions, none of which are particularly complete. It's possible Odysseus is forced to leave Ithaca for 10 years for killing all the suitors. While he's away, it's possible that Telemachus rules, or even Penelope in the name of another son I hadn't heard of before reading this, but that she and Odysseus appear to have had at some point. Odysseus then travels. He possibly marries again, has more children. Who's to say? He dies somehow, someplace, not of old age, but as predicted, he was struck down by some tragedy or other. And finally, there's a version that are the fragments of the telegony. Ugh. There's one version that survives only in fragments, the telegony. It says that Odysseus is killed when his son by Circe, Telegonus, sails in search of his father. It's said that this man raided Ithaca, thinking it was somewhere else, and that Odysseus sets out against the stranger who's raiding his city. Telegonus kills Odysseus on the shores with a spear tipped with the spine of a stingray. Telegonus, learning what he's done, must spend a year in exile before, according to this fragment that I particularly hate. He marries Penelope, which is super fucking weird, and then Telemachus marries Circe, which is also super fucking weird, and then they all move to Circe's island where she makes them immortal. Personally, I think this ending sounds like really, really shitty fan fiction, and I don't like to believe it. I'm telling you all about it because, well, it exists, but also it's in Madeline Miller's Circe. She uses it for her ending. When I read it, I thought that it had to be bullshit, but it isn't. It's just weird and dumb. But other than that possible, though unlikely and very weird and dumb ending, Penelope is a true badass. Maybe she remained faithful to her beloved husband, Odysseus, while he was away, outsmarting the suitors at every turn, even outsmarting her own husband to prove his identity when he finally does arrive home. Or maybe she didn't remain faithful. Maybe she had a bunch of super sexy orgies with all of the men involved, but managed to avoid having to choose any one of them to marry, still while she waited for her husband. Both badass options, honestly. The latter with some pretty unusual sexuality thrown in. It's not every story in Greek mythology where a mortal woman gets to really embrace her sexuality. So you do you, Penelope. You're a queen. Medea. We began her story last week, one of the most famous witches of mythology. Last we spoke, the strong, independent woman had just met Jason. Fucking Jason. Jason has arrived on Medea's land of Colchis on his quest with the Argonauts for the Golden Fleece, which is in the possession of Medea's father, Aetes. Jason needs the fleece. It's the one thing holding him back from regaining his rightful place on the throne of Iolcus. But he can't do it without Medea's help. Jason would fail quite miserably without this woman. So he promises to marry her, to be with her as her partner for the rest of their lives. He swears an oath. Medea, whether she has truly fallen in love with Jason or fallen under a spell, or is just seeking a means of getting away from her maniacal mother and father and all the violence they commit in Colchis, in any of these cases, Medea has agreed to help Jason 
all in exchange for this vow, this oath. And it's vital. There's no divorce in ancient Greece. And without marriage, a woman is ruined. And if she's with the man, but they never marry, or he leaves her, she is quite literally ruined. She would live in disgrace or be forced to return to her parents, though they have no obligation to even take her back. It's seriously fucked up being a woman. You're completely beholden to the man, and they have complete power over your life and your future. Fun. Medea is placing her entire existence in the hands of Jason. She's trusting him with everything. Trusting him because he needs her. He can't do this without her. She imagines that this is putting her in a place of power, that he will keep his oath in exchange for all of this help. And so Medea prepares Jason for the quest her father will set for him in order to obtain the Golden Fleece. She gives Jason a potion for his protection and perfect instructions as to how precisely to complete the tasks Aetes will set. This potion, she explains, needs to be rubbed down on Jason, as well as on his weapons. It will make both invincible. This is the only way to yoke the fire-breathing bulls that Aetes will request. Then, she explains, you'll be asked to plant dragon's teeth. From them, men will spring from the ground and attack you. Medea tells Jason that should too many men be coming at him at once, he should throw a stone into the fray. This will distract them, they'll fight each other until they've all been killed, and he'll be able to escape. Jason's grateful to Medea, she's made this so easy for him, and made perfectly clear that without her, there's no way he'd succeed. The fire-breathing bulls would kill him in a split second were it not for the potion to make him invincible, and the dragon teeth men, they too would kill him, there would be too many of them. He knows he needs Medea. And so Jason promises Medea once more that he will marry her and they will be partners for their whole lives. He will take her back with him to Greece, he tells her. This is all she wants to hear. She wants desperately to get away from Colchis, where her parents are murderous and violent, where she is the only one trying to help people, to help prisoners and strangers. Jason is her savior. Thanks to Medea, Jason is ready when Aetes tells him that, sure, he'll totally give up the Golden Fleece, provided Jason completes just a couple of tasks. No big deal, Aetes says, just yoke these fire-breathing bulls and plant these teeth. But thanks to Medea, Jason isn't worried. He completes the tasks with ease, without issue. It's easy, with Medea's potions and her instructions. Aetes, though isn't willing to give up the Golden Fleece. Not yet. Nope, it was just too easy, he thinks. Jason completed the tasks without any problems at all. It's almost as if he had help. Aetes refuses to give up the Fleece, even though Jason did exactly as he was instructed. Aetes never expected him to succeed, and never planned to give it up in the first place. Instead, he plans to kill Jason and his men and set fire to their ship. But before he can, Medea realizes what he's planning. She knows her father, knows he won't give up the fleece so easily. When he delays, she knows something's up. So that night, Medea puts yet another plan in place. Aetes may not be willing to give up the fleece, but she knows how to get it without the approval of her father. There's a dragon that watches over the golden fleece. Jason must get past it. Thankfully, Jason has Medea. Medea gives him another potion, another that she's made herself for this purpose, using her incredible skills in the magical arts, the art of Pharmaca. She gives Jason a potion that will put the dragon to sleep. He won't have to do anything himself. And it works. Of course it works. Medea knows exactly what she's doing. She's beyond talented. The woman has major skills. Jason, with the help of Medea, puts this dragon to sleep. He's finally obtained the Golden Fleece, and just as promised, Jason brings Medea with him and the other Argonauts. They don't waste any time. They flee Colchis as quickly as they can on the Argo. (laughs) 
Aetes realizes what's happened, and he is furious. He pursues them, or rather, he sends someone to do it, whether for the Golden Fleece or for his daughter, or simply because he was beat by this man and he can't accept it. Aetes sends his son, Medea's brother, Absyrtus, to chase after her and the Argonauts. Absyrtus goes after her with a small army, many, many more men than the Argonauts have, though. They'll surely be killed by Absyrtus and his men. If not, if not for Medea! Through one means or another, Medea meets with her brother. Some say she tricks him, saying she wishes to go back with him to Colchis, or that she'd give him the fleas back, but that they had to meet first. In any case, Medea meets with her brother, Absyrtus, and she kills him. Or some say she'd taken him with her when she left, that she had him on the Argo the whole time as some kind of insurance, and that it was Aetes pursuing them. Or maybe Aetes pursued them after she captured and killed her brother. Regardless of how Aetes came, comes after Medea, Jason, and the Argonauts, the most cinematic version of her brother's death requires Aetes to be following their ship. Because as Aetes follows behind the Argo, as he follows behind his daughter who's just killed her brother as she tries to escape her evil parents and the awful place in which she lived, she realizes she needs to distract her father, Aetes, so that they can get away. And she knows exactly how to do this. Medea stands on the deck of the Argo in view of her father. Aetes is following behind in his ship. And slowly, she begins to cut up the body of her brother into pieces. Piece by piece, chunk by chunk, Medea throws her brother overboard into the water in front of her father's pursuing ship. Her plan works. Her father is, to say the absolute least, distracted. It slows him down because in order for him to give his son a proper burial so that he can rest easy in death in the underworld, Aetes needs all the pieces. He's forced to slow down to pick up the pieces of his son as his daughter throws them overboard. It takes Aetes so long to collect the remnants of his son that Medea, Jason, and the Argonauts are able to escape. How much of what Medea does is evil, and how much is survival? Killing her brother is a stretch, certainly, but if it was done as the only way to escape her father, it becomes less sadistic and more a dark, horrible necessity. Does she help Jason because she loves him, she's devoted to him, or because she sees that he is the way for her to, again, escape? When you read her history as having this evil father and possibly an evil mother, too, who are both hell-bent on punishing and killing any stranger they come across— and then when Medea doesn't have that evil in her, that need to hurt people, that she is in fact the opposite, I can see how she would harden, become tough in the face of simply trying to escape the life she's been forced to live. So Medea and Jason and the Argonauts escape Aetes, and they continue on, trying to reach Jason's homeland of Iolcus. But first, Medea knows she's in need of purification now for the crime she's just committed. Thankfully, the Argo isn't far from Circe's island. Whether she's Medea's sister or her aunt, Medea seeks purification from Circe for the murder of her brother. And she gets it, though the details are scarce if not non-existent. Now purified, the Argo continues on, nearing the island of Crete. Jason and his men want to land there, to rest and call on the hospitality of the Cretans who live on the island. And they're about to when Medea stops them. Medea saves them. She tells the men that the island is home to Talus, the last of the Bronze Age of men, a giant made entirely of bronze and invulnerable except for one ankle. She warns Jason and the Argonauts that they mustn't land there, it isn't safe, and they'd certainly be killed by Talus. Talus was a gift from Zeus to Europa, who he'd left on the island of Crete and who'd started the dynastic family on the island. Talus is its guard, running the perimeter of the island three times a day, protecting it from everything imaginable. 
And just as Medea is telling them this, just as she's trying to convince them that she knows what she's talking about as if she hasn't proven that ten times over already, Talus appears on the shore of the island. He is, as Medea describes, a giant made entirely of bronze, and he is angry and protective of his island. Talus grabs boulders and hurls them at the Argo, threatening to sink the ship if they get too close. They try to get away, but they'd already gotten too close to the island, and they can't get away as quickly as they need to. Talus continues to throw boulders at them. Medea, though, she crouches down to call upon her magic, the magic of the underworld, some form of magic, She calls upon it, asking for help against Talus. She's taken over by it, goes into a trance as she calls upon whatever god or spirit can help her in the moment. It's interesting, the description. It's beyond the way calling to the gods is described anywhere else. It is, in a word, magical. Even though Medea's skills are typically described only in the form of pharmaca, drugs, and potions, here she's able to channel the powers of death, the powers of the underworld. Just as Talus bends down to grab another boulder, this one will surely hit the Argo. His ankle is grazed. Blood pours from the scratch on this bronze man. He'd grazed the exact spot where he could be injured. And with that, as the blood pours from his body, he falls to the ground, the boulder falling from his enormous bronze hands. Finally, Jason, Medea, and the Argonauts reach the Greek mainland after escaping Crete. The Argonauts split up, everyone heading to their homes. Jason and Medea, meanwhile, return to Aeolcus to regain Jason's rightful place on the throne. Peleus is the man currently occupying it. He's taken Aeolcus over, imprisoning Jason's father, Aeason, and he's been protecting the kingdom ever since. After years away, Jason has returned, and Peleus had assigned him the task of gaining this golden fleece. It was a false errand, one Peleus never imagined Jason could complete. It had meant to kill the hero, to take him off of Peleus' hands, but of course that never works, and Jason has Medea, after all. Just like everything Jason has accomplished up to this point, he's not going to be able to do away with Peleus without the help of Medea. Jason is nothing without Medea. He's a hero who would have traveled to Colchis and been immediately killed by the bulls he attempted to yoke. Next week, more of how Medea helps Jason become what he strives to be, and many more times he would fail if it weren't for her intelligence, her planning, and her magic. Oh, thank you all for listening. Well, one last reminder to those of you in or around Vancouver. I will be at the Vancouver Podcast Festival next weekend, November 10th, for a free live show at 1230 at the Downtown Library. There's more information if you search for the Van Podfest or go to my website, mythsbaby.com. I also hope to have whoever is interested join me for a drink after. We can chat about mythology. I can answer any questions you may have. It'll be fun. Plus, there will be beer. So please consider coming out for that. I'd love to see you there. Back next week with Medea's murderous streak. You're all the best. As usual, please rate, review, subscribe, the whole thing. Tell your friends, too. And to those of you asking... Don't worry, I'll be covering the Aeneid. I'm just taking a short break in between epics to cover some other fun characters and happenings in the mythology. But I wouldn't neglect our boy, the founder of Rome himself, Aeneas. Thank you all. I'm Liv, and I do love this shit.